Hello, I'm glad you could join us for podcast number 15 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we'll take a look at the colony of North Carolina. North Carolina was aptly described by one historian as the foster child of Virginia and the sister of South Carolina. This is because North and South Carolina were originally one colony and because so many people from Virginia moved southward into Carolina that it made sense to divide the colony into two separate colonies. In order to get an accurate view of what colonial North Carolina was like, we have to do so without the lens of the American Civil War. We have to go back to a time before that, a time when medieval-style English lords owned the colony, to a time when colonist farmers aspired to imitate their counterparts in England, and to a time when East versus West was more important than North versus South. North Carolina has a long shoreline with many isolated coves that make ideal hiding places, For a time, North Carolina's shores were the base of operations for many pirates, including the notorious Blackbeard. North Carolina's vast pine forests provided an ample supply of the raw material needed to produce tar, a critical resource for navies back then. For this reason, North Carolina had important strategic value for the British Empire. To this day, it is still known as the Tar Heel State. As was the case with the other southern colonies, North Carolina's backcountry was volatile, When the War of Independence came to North Carolina, it was often personal and brutal. Perhaps nothing illustrates North Carolina's independent attitude as much as the fact that it was the first colony to approve of independence, while over a decade later, it was nearly last among the states to ratify the U.S. Constitution. The very first English colony established in North America was technically within the boundaries of the modern state of North Carolina. I talk about that in my podcast number three, Dealing with Virginia. Originally, North and South Carolina were one colony, but it was a very large colony. In fact, it was probably the largest of all the colonies land-wise. The colonial capital for Carolina was Charlestown, which today we call Charleston. As people began to settle different parts of the colony, especially people from Virginia coming south into Carolina, it did make sense to have a capital so far away from so many other population centers. Occasionally, there were regional jealousies that played in as well. A separation between North and South Carolina had already been occurring, but by 1712, the situation was formalized when both colonies were given their own governors. Like many of the other colonies we've examined in this series, North Carolina was a proprietary colony. That meant that the king had granted to several of his friends the rights to own and operate the colony. It was kind of like having medieval lords. They ran it as their own little feudal manor. The proprietors appointed the governor and also approved the laws. Proprietary government was never very popular in the colonies. The English people, or the colonists who were English that came over from England, were used to being represented in a parliament. And although each colony had some kind of representative assembly, these assemblies often clashed with the governors and the proprietors. One of the early situations that illustrates this conflict was the situation with a very corrupt governor, Governor Sothel. He took bribes and confiscated people's estates. He had opponents thrown in jail. And finally, the assembly tried him and banished him from the colony. So here was a very early case in point. You had Sothel appointed by the proprietors coming to conflict with the people's assembly who were elected by the people. North Carolina never developed any large towns or big population centers. For a while, the seat of government even seemed to travel around the state. The legislature was often called at different towns by the governor, and it was kind of called the traveling legislature. This irritated people and and stirred up some of the regional jealousies within North Carolina. It wasn't until the 1740s that the seat of government was fixed at New Bern. One of the other incidents that caused quite a bit of alarm was the time that the assembly had the sergeant of arms go out and arrest the governor's tax collector. It's hard to imagine that happening in a modern setting, but back then things like that did happen as the assembly saw themselves as a miniature parliament, which saw themselves as kind of a court of law. One of the events that caused a great deal of irritation just before the War of Independence was the construction of the governor's palatial palace. The cost of construction was 15,000 pounds, which was an enormous sum back then. It was an irritant to the people who had to pay poll taxes, especially in the back country. One of the more interesting things that occurred in North Carolina's early history was piracy. As English officials attempted to sweep the Caribbean clear of pirates, many of them simply relocated to North Carolina shores. North Carolina's shoreline was long and it had many isolated places for them to hide. And as was the case with many other colonies, pirates often were able to bribe colonial officials to look the other way. 
British regulations also encouraged a certain amount of smuggling and piracy as well. Occasionally, the king would attempt to stem the tide of piracy by simply offering periodic pardons. It doesn't seem to have worked very well, though. In 1719, there were scores of pirates tried and hanged in the Carolinas. The most famous pirate that haunted North Carolina's shores, and perhaps one of the most famous pirates of all time, was Blackbeard. He was eventually defeated in battle in 1718. His head was cut off and hung from the brow sprit of the ship that captured him. One of the ships that Blackbeard used in his piracy was called Queen Anne's Revenge, and the wreckage of it was found in the 90s off the coast of North Carolina. As colorful as the piracy may have been, it never threatened to destroy the colony. That threat came instead from the Tuscarora Indians. Many of the colonies faced a life-or-death struggle with the Indians. The New England colonies were badly mauled during King Philip's War. Virginia was nearly wiped out in the first few decades of its existence in the war with the Indians. And South Carolina faced a similar war with the Yamasee. That kind of war came to North Carolina in 1711 with the Tuscarora Indians. These wars were never strictly colonist versus Indian types of wars. The colonists normally had Indian allies helping them, and their Indian opponents had other Indian allies that helped them as well. That was certainly the case in the Tuscarora War. Tuscarora Indians had Cory, Pamlico, and Bear River Indians for their allies, while the North Carolina colonists had the Yamases and the Cherokees as their allies. The war between the North Carolina colonists and the Tuscarora Indians followed the usual pattern. In these wars, the Indians usually had the initiative. They could pick and choose which settlements to attack on the frontier, and it was impossible for the colonists to defend everywhere. By the time the colonists could respond or militia could arrive at the scene of an attack, it was too late. I'll spare you the details about these attacks because they're pretty horrible. And of course, the colonists responded in kind in revenge. They found one Indian chief that they had captured and roasted him alive over an open fire. The colonists were finally able to prevail. It took some time for them to marshal their resources, but they probably couldn't have done so without the critical help provided by their Indian allies, the Yamasee and the Cherokee Indians. Like the other southern colonies, North Carolina's economy revolved primarily around agricultural pursuits. The climate supported a large variety of fruits and vegetables, including what they called the love apples, or in modern terms we would call tomatoes. Corn became an important crop for feeding the population. It had the advantage that unlike wheat, it could be grown in areas that weren't entirely clear of trees or other bushes. Many farmers adopted the Indian way of growing corn. You formed little mounds, planted corn in it with dead fish, and then in between the corn, corn mounds, you could plant pumpkins and squash and melon, beans, and other vegetables and fruits. British regulations prevented the colonies from coining money, so there was always a critical shortage of money in the colonies to use for paying for things. So the North Carolina legislature actually passed a law making certain farm commodities to be used as legal tender. This is very similar to what Virginia and Maryland did. In those colonies, tobacco literally served as money. And in time, tobacco became one of the most important cash crops grown in North Carolina. North Carolina also had endless pine forests. Pine trees were important for making tar, pitch, and turpentine, which at that time were critically important for the Navy, for helping to waterproof the ships. This allowed the English to free themselves from dependence on tar produced in Sweden. The Anglican Church, or Church of England, was the officially established Church of North Carolina, but the proprietors were lax about establishing it, and interestingly, for the first few decades, the only organized church in North Carolina were the Quakers. In 1729, the Crown bought out the proprietors and took over the government of the colony. But this same laxness continued, and people from all over Europe flooded into North Carolina, people from Germany, Switzerland, Scotland, Ireland, and even from Wales. And even though North Carolina had a policy of an officially established religion, as long as these people were Protestant, they fared pretty well and were treated respectably. By 1770, the population of North Carolina was about 200,000 people, making it one of the larger colonies, certainly larger than its sister colony to the south, South Carolina. North Carolina did not have as nearly a large of slave population as did South Carolina. And of course, South Carolina really was the most slave-concentrated colony in the colonies. In the 1760s, the British government began taxing the colonies directly. The colonists felt that since they were not represented in Parliament, they could not consent to these taxes. Joining and dissenting with the other colonies, the North Carolina Assembly published this address to the king, saying, 
This is a taxation which we are fully persuaded the acknowledged principles of the British Constitution ought to protect us from. Free men cannot be legally taxed but by themselves or their representatives, and that your majesty's subjects within this province are represented in Parliament we cannot allow, and are convinced that from our situation we never can be. As resistance led to armed rebellion, the governors in each colony discovered they had less and less authority, and this was certainly the case in North Carolina. Governor Martin complained about what he called the propensity of this people to democracy. In a letter to the British government, Governor Martin complained that royal government is here as absolutely prostrate, as impotent, and nothing but the shadow of it is left. He went on to say that unless effectual measures were speedily taken, there will not long remain a trace of Britain's dominions over these colonies. He described his own situation as most despicable and mortifying. He went on to write, I daily see indignantly the sacred majesty of my royal master insulted, the rights of his crown denied and violated, his government set at naught and trampled upon, his servants of highest dignity reviled, traduced, abused, the rights of his subjects destroyed by the most arbitrary usurpations, and the whole constitution unhinged and prostrate, and I live, alas, ingloriously only to deplore it. So it sounds as though Governor Martin was not having a good time as his authority was more and more ignored by the people of the colony. Like so many of the other governors, Governor Martin was forced to flee the colony. He first fled to a fort, and then a few days later fled to a waiting British warship off the coast. And he did so just in time, because Patriot Militia burned the fort. And if he had waited there much longer, he probably would have been burnt with it. During the first few years of the Revolutionary War, the southern colonies remained relatively untouched. That all changed in the summer of 1780. The British invaded the south, and from Charleston began marching northwards. The British thought that by making a good show of force, innumerable loyalists would show themselves and come out to support the crown in the south and eventually deal with the north in this way, by isolating it. Ultimately, this plan did not work, but one of the important battles that ended up laying ultimate foundation for British defeat occurred in North Carolina. This was the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, which occurred in March of 1781. The British army, under Lord Cornwallis, had won several important battles as it marched north. The American strategy, on the other hand, was not so much to win battles, but just not to lose them. They could wear down through attrition the British resources and men. It was very difficult for the British to replace their losses. The battle at Guilford Courthouse was one such battle. Technically, the British won since the Americans evacuated the field, but the British took several hundred casualties, both killed and wounded, which could not be replaced. At one point in the battle, the British troops became hopelessly entangled in a hand-to-hand fight with American troops. In order to stop the thing, the British general, Cornwallis, actually had his artillery fire into the mess, killing both his own men and the Americans. It was a desperate measure, but in the end it worked. There were a few other battles and skirmishes in Virginia, but ultimately the campaign did not work, and just seven months after the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, the British surrendered at Yorktown. For further reading and information on this subject, I recommend the following books and articles. Colonial North Carolina, A History by Hugh T. Leffler and William S. Powell. Partisans and Redcoats, The Southern Conflict that Turned the Tide of the American Revolution by Walter Edgar. The Rhetoric of Revenge, Atrocity and Identity in the Revolutionary Carolinas by Ben Rubin, published in the Journal of Backcountry Studies, Volume 5, Number 5, Fall 2010. The Payment of Provincial and Local Taxes in North Carolina, 1748 through 1771, by Marvin L. Michael Kay, published in the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 26, Number 2, April 1969. The Breakdown of the Royal Management of Lands in the Southern Provinces, 1773 to 1775, by St. George L. Sousat, published in the Agricultural History, Volume 3, Number 2, April 1929. Politics in Colonial South Carolina, The Failure of Proprietary Reform, 1682-1694, through 1694, by M. Eugene Sermons, published in the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 23, Number 1, January 1966. And I recommend podcast number 10 in my series, which covers South Carolina and covers a lot of the early history of the Carolinas. 